Hi and welcome to the Lean Startup Conference webcast, an introduction to Lean Impact. We're waiting for a few more viewers to join this webcast. We'll start in just a few minutes. Hi everyone, thanks for joining our webcast. Today we're pleased to present an introduction to Lean Impact. I'm Melissa Moore, executive producer of the Lean Startup Conference, happening December 8 to 12 in San Francisco. Visit leanstartup.co for more information. Our speakers today are Leanne Pittsford and Sarah Melstein. Leanne Pittsford is a CEO and founder of Start Summer, helping social good organizations with tech and design. She's also the founder of Lean Impact, a community of social good organizations, and the founder of Lesbians Who Tech. Sarah Melstein is CEO and co-founder with Eric Rees of Lean Startup Productions, the media company behind this webcast and behind the Lean Startup Conference, which Sarah and Eric co-host. So, just a few reminders for everyone. We'll take questions from the audience via the live chat. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the question box to flag it. Our speakers will answer questions to, in the second half of this webcast. No need to ask your questions twice. This is a one-hour program, and the recording will be available a few days after this live webcast. Take it away, Sarah and Leanne. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Um, it's great to be here, and thanks, Leanne, so much for joining us. Um, I want to dive right in because there's so much to cover and not that much time to cover it in. So, Leanne, let's get started talking about uh, Lean Startup itself, what it is and what it isn't. Let's just go over some of the basics. So I think Lean Startup for me has really been centered around experiments, right? Um, you know, I think that there's so much time into planning and strategizing and what's the best way to do things, and for me it's really around saving time, eliminating waste. I think that I was so attracted to Lean Startup as a model because it was really around finding the right nugget and, and building upon that. But, you know, really trying to find out the right nugget is often about figuring out what are the wrong nuggets. And you can't really do that unless you try it. You know, I think, I, you know, I spent a lot of my time in the nonprofit sector and the social goods sector. And, um, and now for the last four years, I've, I've ran my own tech company. But, you know, really in the social good world, there's just so much emphasis on planning and it was just so incredible to see a framework that was really built on experimentation and actually getting the data by trying something instead of thinking about it and, and visualizing it and, and imagining how it would be instead of um, actually how it is in the real world. Um, and obviously, you know, things like MVP and minimum viable product and, and getting feedback and build, measure, learn cycles and all those things. Um, you know, are part of the Lean Startup and I think a part of how social good organizations can implement it into, the, into their real everyday um, work. Yeah, so you just mentioned a bunch of um, kind of the jargon terms of Lean Startup MVPs and um, pivots and things like that. So build, measure, learn. We'll get into that as we go. Um, so if those are terms that are unfamiliar to people joining us, fear not. We will cover all of that. Um, so, right, so at the heart of Lean Startup is experimentation and the idea that um, 
what you don't know is probably more important than what you do know, and um, try to find figure out ways to get information you don't know so you can build on a more solid ground. Um, so let's talk about kind of the old vision versus the new vision. You know, how is it that, like, why should nonprofits and mission-driven organizations care? What is it that they've done in the past that maybe could be done differently and better using Lean Startup? Totally. And one of the things I hear a lot, you know, when we when we started um, doing events, especially around Lean Impact and, and what would the Lean Startup look like for social good organizations, a lot of times I'd get these, like, really quick comments, like, oh, we're super lean, you know, we do this with all volunteers and um, we have no budget and, and all, you know, that would sort of be the instant reaction. And, and a lot of times, you know, if we're having a conversation, I'd say, look, like, you know, lean isn't necessarily about um, doing more with less. All, you know, it's not about doing things on a bare budget all the time. It's about just starting with the most simple thing that you can test, right? And, um, and since I spend a lot of my time now in both the social good world and, and more of the traditional kind of startup tech space, you know, people actually ask me, you know, what, what's the biggest difference between these two worlds? And, you know, the thing that's been the most powerful for me is that traditional companies just have a better sense that they will 100% fail if they don't invest in the infrastructure. Um, and, the, and that there has to be a critical point when they really sort of invest in all the things that will help them scale, else they won't succeed. And I think, you know, that's the part of Lean Startup, I think the magic in it that we want to adapt for social good organizations. Um, obviously, there's a lot of differences um, with social good organizations, depending on what your revenue model is, where you're getting your funding. Um, you know, those are the sort of things we think about when we're trying to adapt the vernacular. Um, oftentimes, you know, when you're, if you're running an experiment, you could be running an experiment for the group that's funding the work and also an experiment for um, the group of people you're trying to serve. And oftentimes those aren't the two, same two groups of people. Um, sometimes there is overlap, obviously. Um, and again, it depends on your revenue model, but sometimes they're different. Right, right. Okay, so very specifically, you know, we start talking about company infrastructure, but I think of Lean Startup as really being about building products and services. So when you were talking about infrastructure, what did you have in mind? Well, you know, I mean, I think infrastructure can be a lot of things. I mean, for, you know, I, I work a lot in kind of the, the nuts and bolts in organizations, you know. So infrastructure, if you're building a product, is how do you, how do you sell that product? How do you continually, you know, sell more products to the, your same customers, right? So a lot of organizations, they, they might not have the best database. Like all of their data on their customers is living in Excel spreadsheet. Um, so if you want to email to that group of people, you actually don't have the tools you need to like email them in a really like strong and efficient way. Um, and it's sort of, and those sort of things take money and time. And a lot of times, you know, a company will sort of, once they figure out what's working and, and the revenue model's going, right, and that's the, the point they can sort of, um, they can raise money. Um, they have a data that shows, look, like this is selling and if we raise $3 million, we'll be able to do this with the $3 million. And that, that can happen in social good organizations too. It's just that oftentimes the funders want, it's a slower process and you have to get the money from a different group of people that's not really maybe understanding how you're going about it. And there's this whole culture. I mean, this is kind of where I think um, the social good world is, is a little broken, but there's a culture where um, people who are giving the money, they're doing it for a variety of reasons, but they really want to know how much of the dollar is going to the work. How much of your dollar is funding the actual work and oftentimes admin, things like databases, things like staff actually gets put in this like term called overhead. And um, I think that's where I'd like to see a cultural shift because without, especially in the beginning, I mean, you need to be spending you know, money on marketing, admin to really build um, a solid infrastructure to be able to do more good. Um, it's, it's one of those things that if you raise you know, $5 million, but it costs you a million dollars to raise the five, you know, you could do so much more with that $4 million than if 100% of $100,000 went to the work, right? I mean, obviously, like, just it's a simple math. Right. Okay, great. So we'll talk a little bit more about the funding models and why there's some tension in them after we talk more about some of the Lean Startup methods. But I think you make a great point in two different ways, that Lean Startup isn't about um, bootstrapped or not having enough cash. It's about a, a methodology. Um, and it's about using your money most effectively to learn more about your customers and to build your products best. And sometimes that can be at odds with a funding, um, a funding structure, but fundamentally it's really about trying to move faster. 
So let's talk about that piece of it. You said earlier that experimentation is at the heart of it, and we typically talk about um, experiments using the term minimum viable product, or an MVP, which is kind of a sexy term that is misused all the time. So um, be great if you could explain what that is and give an example or two of social organizations um, using it. Yeah, definitely. So I'll start with um, one, uh, which I also run, called Lesbians Who Tech. And so just to give you a little bit of context on sort of how or why we started, uh, the problem we were trying to solve, which I think is always a good place to start, right? What problem are you trying to solve and who are you trying to solve it for? And so for lesbians, um, you know, I came, I came from uh, Equality California, which is one of the organizations working on Nolan Prop 8. Um, I was a staff person there for five years, and I learned a lot of lessons. Um, one of the big ones was around economic power, um, around gender diversity, um, you know, the gay rights movement. Uh, for me, was just very male-dominated. Most of the funders were gay white men, and, um, you know, I ran all the data for the campaign, and so I would sort of look at the numbers and, and just kind of realize that, as a, as a queer woman, I wanted to, um, you know, give back more in an economic sense. And so I actually started, that's how I started my own business um, and kind of entered into the, the regular or to the more traditional Silicon Valley tech world. And when I entered that world, I was like, oh, my God, like the, the sort of sexism was even worse in there than the gay movement. And um, it was just really challenging getting lesbians or queer women to attend um, uh, fundraising events or, you know, it's just hard to find um, really good ones. Every time you go to an LGBT event, it'd be like 90% men. And so um, we just started, decided our MVP was going to be just hosting these really small happy hours. Um, I think our first one, we didn't even have an event break, which is a, a tool for event registration, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, we just had a, a Facebook um, event and I sent out an email. I think like 40 people came and then uh, we did one another month and and then I did an event bright, and um, by the second month, we actually had over 100 uh, people show up to our event in San Francisco. Um, and obviously, at the event, I would talk to them and sort of figure out what they wanted and what they were looking for. And um, you know, it kind of all happened so fast, and people were just like, you know, you should you should start a nonprofit, and you should you know do all these things. Um, but we really wanted to figure out, you know, a like who who was this community because these were new people. Part of our experiment and our MVP was. Do, do lesbians even exist in tech, right? Is this, is this a market that um, needs something? Is there value that they want? And, you know, we were, I didn't want to create an organization to solve a problem until I really figured out if the problem was similar to what I was feeling um, because obviously I was also a lesbian in tech. But, um, so we kept doing the happy hours and um, more and more people emailed us asking to host events in different cities. Um, and we actually, I think we're almost eight or nine months in before we even built a website, which was kind of the next step of the process, um, you know, and doing uh, more customer development and things like that to figure out what the community wanted. But really, it was just a Facebook page and an email was, was our MVP there. Um, I'll give you another example, sort of more relevant. I'm going to interrupt for just a sec yeah. because it was a great example. But let's define an MVP first so that people really understand what it is. Can you give a, a, a quick definition the way you think about it? Yeah, so an MVP is a minimum viable product, so it's that thing that you can kind of put into the universe um, for customers to interact with, right, and so to begin that feedback process. Um, you know, I think, think about it like this, it's sort of, it's something that you might not be totally proud of, but it's, it's the, literally the first thing that allows you to get real feedback. Um, so a lot of times, it, it could be anything, it could be like a photo, on Instagram, you know, where people can comment on it. Anything you can sort of put into the world and, and um, interact with the potential customer base you're trying to work with. Why is that important? I mean, why not build out a full product when you have a vision, you kind of know your customer base or the people you're trying to serve? Why wouldn't you build something big to start? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. And I think it's something that I'm surprised by all the time, how wrong I can be even when I'm in the customer demographic. So, you know, I'm a lesbian in tech and now our kind of current um, product is a summit and I never would have guessed a summit or, or I would never, that would never have been my sort of MVP into the world or um, product that I thought was going to be it. We, we, we got there and now it makes total sense looking back how we got to the summit because it was like a series of minimum viable products. It was a series of, you know, a lot of feedback, a lot of customer development and a lot of experimentation, but we never would have gotten there in the beginning. And I think it's so important to remember that even if you are in the target group, and this is the thing I hear from entrepreneurs or um, founders of nonprofits all the time, is that 
because they have their experience, they think that they know what's going to solve the problem. But oftentimes you just get so surprised by the way um, experiments go. And I think getting that data also too, I mean, there's so many variables, right? Time, place, um, you know, I mean, think about the way the world is now with the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the APIs and how much we can build. I mean, a product today, um, I mean, even Airbnb, right? I mean, Airbnb would have never been able to exist before Craigslist. I mean, just it probably culturally it wouldn't have been able to exist in the way that it did. I mean, even VRBO, these things are, you know, part of the reason that, you know, other things can iterate on top of things. Um, right. So the way we tend to think about it is that we use an MVP to help test our assumptions about, usually about customers, right? Like, as you said, as entrepreneurs, as founders, we often think we really know our customers. And whether they're like us or not, it might be a very distant population, we're, we're st we started something because we think there's a need. We think we know what our customer base wants. But it turns out that in the vast majority of cases, we don't actually know. We don't know how to serve them well, we don't really know exactly what their needs are, or we don't really know how they're going to respond to the product idea we have. So as you said, you started out with events, and you started with them small, but you didn't think that was going to take you into bigger events. You thought it would draw a community around you, and you could go from there, but events weren't where you thought things were going. And that's pretty typical. Usually companies, I mean, this is one of the things that define startups, is because you don't know what you're doing, right? Not that you don't know what you're doing, but you have a lot of risk, because there's tons of uncertainty in what you're building, the place you start is very often not where you end up. So we have some really spectacular examples of that in the world, like YouTube started as a video dating site. When the dating part didn't take off, the video <laughs> sharing part was still interesting, and they pursued that. Um, Flickr started as a an, an game over IM, and the, the game part didn't take off, but the, the photo sharing did. Um, so often what you think your customer or your user base would want turns out not to be right, although some core of your idea is really, um, really flies. So, you know, you want to build something that's small to figure out whether you're in the right neighborhood for your customers and what to build from there, rather than building a huge thing that it turns out doesn't serve the population you thought you were building for. Um, we particularly tend to talk about MVPs as a tool to answer a question you might have about your population. So, in your case, um, the question might be, you know, do lesbians in tech want to connect with each other? Right. Events are a, a small event where you didn't even build an event web page. All you did was put it up on, on Facebook. That's a very lightweight way to answer that question very quickly. So you're not spending a lot of time and money. Exactly. So I would love you to, I had interrupted you to ask for a little more definition on MVP, and you had um, another example you were going to give, and I would love to hear another example help people understand what are the kinds of things you can test for. Right. So, you know, a little bit, it's similar but a little different. So, you know, Lean Impact, which is, you know, basically a community of people who are um, trying to implement Lean Startup in a social um, good organization or framework. Um, you know, we really, we were really excited about this idea, really excited about, you know, Lean Startup in general. And at the time, and this was, you know, probably like three years ago now that we started thinking about this, um, you know, most people in our world, in the nonprofit world especially, hadn't heard of Lean Startup. Um, they didn't know what it was, they didn't know what it meant. And so, and obviously, if you, if you haven't even heard of it, it's sort of, um, it's a big education gap and like how are we going to um, first tell people about it, what it is, and then how do we sort of figure out if there is some value there that people get from understanding these principles more. And then, and then the next step is like how do they integrate in a way that makes sense um, for their organization. And so, um, in a similar way, we, we hosted, um, we actually tried to do an online telesummit first, um, charging $20, you know, keep it really low, um, get some speakers, and just sort of um, see if it was something that people would sign up for. We obviously wanted to do this in a sustainable way, um, thinking about the risk of, you know, investing kind of the capital up front to, to create the organization. We want to keep that low, and obviously things like a telesummit, online summit, um, would keep that low. So that was our MVP there, and we actually, we, we, it totally failed. Um, we had, I think, three people sign up that we ended up uh, refunding, and this was, you know, we had sent many emails, um, you know, my personal list in the social good world wasn't small, um, and so we really had to take a step back and think about, okay, well, why did that fail? We had to make some more assumptions 
um, and then come up uh, with the next MVP um, that you know we could figure out even more data. And so we decided to, um, you know, we decided that it would take a little more investment, which we had to really decide if we were willing to make that investment um, and keep testing it. But we had a series of events in um, D.C., San Francisco, and New York. Um, kind of, we felt like the biggest markets where people would be interested in this. And we had free events because we felt like part of the barrier to entry was the price point. You know, this is such a new idea, such a new topic, um, and that if we're really going to see if the social good world was interested in this, um, we had to keep it free. We found leaders in the community that were already using Lean Startup um, to speak, um, but we had them at, at bars, you know, kept them free, kept the expenses low. And we actually, in, in each of the three cities, we had over 400 people sign up. Um, I think in New York we had over 500 people sign up and around 200 to 300 people walk in the door. And that was kind of enough data to tell us that we were, you know, kind of willing to keep going with it and, and figure out what the next steps would be. So that's cool. I mean, one of the things you just mentioned is that you had a test that seemingly failed. Nobody responded. In a way, you know, it's not, it's not a failure if you learn something quickly and cheaply, right? I mean, the, your assumption was proven wrong, but having something disproved fast before you've spent a lot of time and money is a huge win when you can learn from that and move quickly onto something else um, with the resources you might otherwise have poured into something that wasn't going to succeed. Um, so that's a great example, too. You had mentioned to me earlier some other examples um, from other organizations, and some of them international. Um, one in particular I was intrigued by um, an organization using um, a texting system, I believe, with farmers in India. Can you talk about that? The, I mean, very different context, what it was they were trying to test and how they did it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, culturally, there's a lot of social good organizations that are, you know, the, the group that's funding it and the staff, you know, could be in America, but they're actually serving people in India. And a lot of times you build an app that's sort of built on a whole assumption that this type of technology is something they integrate. And so for this organization, you know, they were really, it was all about getting data fast um, and sort of farming and, and connected to water and connected to all these things. And, you know, I think they weren't, sure how this was going to work and so they just instead of like creating a whole email system and email structure they started with text messaging and I think it was something um, that ended up really working and gave them a bunch of data that they weren't expecting to see and then they could kind of integrate that into a new ways. Um, another example of an organization that I'm sure most people have heard of um, is IDEO and, and they obviously have a huge international reach um, and they were building a, a financial model in Mexico um, which would end up being an ATM type of thing for people but they weren't sure, um, you know, how the community would interact with it. And so instead of, like, actually building an ATM, they built, um, they just used kind of mock-ups, like, in, like, you know, not even a real website, just, like, a design mock-up on an iPad. And then they actually put cardboard around it um, to, like, mimic the real ATM experience for people. And they sat with their um, potential customers and sort of saw how they, you know, moved their hand and, you know, did their hand go left or right and, like, were certain buttons too big and, like, how did they sort of interact actually with the interface without building the whole product, which would have been much more expensive. And they probably, that feedback allowed them to build a much, um, you know, better product that um, was more helpful for people. Yeah, that's great. We've had some terrific stories from IDEO, um, too. And in fact, um, Jocelyn Wyatt from IDEO.org spoke at the Lean Startup Conference a couple of years ago um, and told a story about testing ideas um, around um, a toilet that they wanted to build and had really um, the US based group <clears throat> turned out to have made a bunch of assumptions that were completely incorrect and they figured that out through a series of tests that were live that really helped them move very quickly and um, learn a ton without building something that nobody was going to use. We have, we have the, um, the link for that which we'll dump into the chat for everybody. Yeah. Um, so that's great. I think those are, are really good examples of the MVP of experimentation, um, why it's so important. Um, you know, one, we had one um, participant make a comment that I think is worth reading. It's kind of interesting. Um, he says, Christopher says, one of the unanticipated benefits of integrating lean startup, um, lean impact into nonprofit is that it can improve employee morale because through experimentation, they can see the results of their efforts and learn from them so much more quickly than with lengthy planning cycles. And I think that's pretty interesting because on the one hand, I think that's totally true. And on the other hand, 
um, sometimes people can get a little bit demoralized because you can test a lot of things that get disproven. It turns out your ideas were not as great as you thought, um, and it can kind of bring everybody down a little bit. How do how have you combated that? You know, you actually when you were talking before mm -hmm. about the thing you tested that only four people showed signed up for, and it felt a little blue. You just you looked a little like you felt a little blue. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm <wondering>, yeah. <laughs> You know, how do you deal with what can sometimes be a fast failure? Right. Well, and I think, I think you know, I think the really interesting part about the social good world, um, and, I mean, one of the big challenges we have to solve for that I, I think is nowhere near being solved is, you know, when you're working in social good, it's often not about how much money you're making as an employee, right? Um, salaries are just, they're not in the same range. And part of that is a market problem. People will pay what they can for good talent. And um, so, and you know, when people want to do something that they care about, that they believe in, they're we're often willing to make less money. Um, and I think because of that, psychologically, as humans, we still need value. And oftentimes, our value comes from our sort of self worth in the job. And that obviously comes from being able to make decisions, to be able to see results, to be able to see your ideas get implemented into the world and to um, have a little bit of control and power around that. I think I think we sort of don't acknowledge that enough in the social good world. Um, and I think it's a real thing and I think it's playing a role in, a, in how decisions get made in a real way. And so while I think experimentation is really great to sort of have a transparent view of what's really happening, um, you know, oftentimes I've seen leaders, you know, they, they just, they need their um, they need their vision to be out there in the world, and without that, um, you know, they sort of their a purpose around that job just be, you know, sort of uh, becomes less. And so I think that's something, and that's why experimentation also can be great, though, because then it sort of it takes the the power out of that reality, and it's like, look, we're all in this together. Um, this is just what worked, and we all kind of got to try our ideas, um, and this is the one that was the most successful because of A, B, and C. And then it's not so much a well, you know he always gets his way or she always gets his way because they're there, the most senior person. You know, it's like we tried these five ideas, we came up, come, came up with them as a team, and um, we have real data around um, why or why not we're not going to move forward. Yeah, one of the things that I like to say is that you can tell you are making progress using lean startup methods when you start to use data rather than job titles to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I think you made a good point too, is that if you're experimenting quickly and you get good at it, I mean, it's a muscle to build, it takes some practice, but if you get good at it, everybody's ideas can get tested. It's not just like, oh, we only have the resources to build one thing. You have more shots to try things and everyone's ideas can get, can get tested. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the other techniques and, and we'll see how those wrap into experimentation over time. Um, one of the important ones is customer development and getting a little closer to your customer. So we've talked about, you know, how do you work with people who are like you or not like you, but what do we mean when we talk about customer development specifically? Yeah. I mean, I think customer development is, you know, not, it's not too far away from what we were talking about with the MVP and sort of it's that process of getting the minimum viable product in the hands of the customer and then working with that customer to get real feedback. And I think, you know, the point that I really want to drive home in the social good world is that a lot of times people think this process is around surveys, it's around polls, it's around sort of, you know, things you can do online oftentimes. And I can't stress enough how that's, you know, it's not invaluable. I don't want to say that, you know, there are times where that makes sense and that might be the only thing you can do. But I think it, it's really distracting often, and I think people, you know, I mean, when you send out a survey, right, after an event, it's part of the process, and it's a part of getting feedback, um, and you want people to have a voice. Um, but the people who fill that out are oftentimes the people who are probably less happy with you than the people who are happy. That you know, when I the other day I went to a restaurant, and I haven't used Yelp in I think three years, but it was so bad that I like just had had to do it. Um, and I think that you know, customer development is really you have to see facial expressions. You have to hear the tone. I mean, even how you saw like how I got about the failure with the online summit, right? My facial expression probably told you so much more about how I was feeling than the words coming out of my mouth. Um, and I think, and, the, and then you can kind of decide how to keep going. Um, so uh, one of my friends, she, um, she works in India um, around um, distribution channels um, for solar products primarily. 
And so one of the, you know, they basically do customer development all the time and they, other people's products sort of, they use them as a channel. And um, a lot of times it's like solar, it's all around lighting, you know, and sort of getting um, safe instead of like kerosene stuff, getting um, more safe solar lighting in the hands of, of people who live in India. Um, and they were doing customer development around one of these products, one of these lamps, and it came out that, you know, what they really want is a solar, um, like a solar blender, like a, a blender, right? Like they make um, sort of drinks like with blenders and like a lot of yogurt and things like that. And that's like, that was the, the product that came out of the testing with the, the customer development process, which sort of like shocked, I think, the people who were making the lamp. Like they just didn't even think about a blender because that's not like a high end, like in terms of like everyday use, right? Like maybe in America, that's not like what people are most concerned about is like blending a drink. But, um, you know, I think when you end up having face to face, you put a product in the hands of someone and people like literally play with buttons. Like you just, you end up getting feedback that you never would have even guessed was possible. Yeah, so I love that you noted that surveys are not where this stuff ends. Um, you know, we use the phrase getting out of the building um, to describe the idea of going to learn from your customers, and that's usually literally what you have to do is actually leave where you are and go see people in person. If they're very remote, of course, there are tools to do things online over video and so forth. But you know, the idea is that you really want to talk to people. Um, but surveys are so tempting, and so one of the things that I find is that surveys can be useful if you put an idea out there and 99% of the people who respond to it say, we would never use this. That's a pretty strong signal. That's great. You can yeah. move on. But if 99% of people said, yeah, sure, I'd use it, but they've never seen it, they've never been asked to pay for it, they've never interacted with it, it's not a very strong signal. So you can get sometimes a strong no from mm -hmm. surveys or some other low-touch kind of um, data collection, but you usually can't get a really strong yes and a strong signal of what people do want and what they will um, engage with until you've actually gotten something in front of them. Totally. Yeah, no, I don't think surveys are completely, you know, I, and I think part of it is just, it's, it's a different topic, but customer happiness, right? You have to give people the ability to tell you what they think about your product, and you have to take that into consideration, and I think you just you just have to know that in terms of, um, that it's not it's not the only piece of data, and it's especially, you know, so helpful to have the in-person stuff. I think we use it as a crutch because it's cheaper to do a survey, and it's sort of, it's more online, and um, or it may, 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 might not be cheaper, but it'll take less time um, than going in person and, and finding um, the target group. You know, for Lesbian to Tech, we a lot of our community was all over the world, and so we did Google Hangouts with people. Actually, did like twenty or thirty, like ten person Google Hangouts with people, and and even like Google Hangouts having a group Google Hangout versus one on one. I mean, that was just such a different experience, right? Like a lot of in politics, you know, polling is like um, or group. Um, you know, getting groups together and talking about issues, which is not, it's, it's important, and that's a different thing than, like, the one-on-one -on -one stuff, right? Um, because obviously what people say in front of a group will, can, uh, can be different than what they'll do, um, you know, in a voting booth, for example, or on the phone, or when it's just to one person. And so that keeping in mind the psychology of all of this, I think, is, is really, really important. Um, another example of, of customer development, so I've run a lot of mentoring programs um, in my past, in my life, and one of the things that we're working on with Lesbians to Tech is, you know, what programs can we build? And, and oftentimes, you know, people say mentoring, and I kind of I push back a little bit, and some of the things I've noticed why, why it hasn't worked is, is that there's no urgency. They're, it's like you, they say they want it, and that's, that's the thing with customer development, right? What, what people say they want is often so different than what they actually want or what they'll actually pay for or what they'll actually use. And I think that's what you have to keep in mind. It's like, okay, this is what you want, and then you run an experiment to see if it's what they want. And with mentoring, I've run several experiments to see if it's what they want. And oftentimes, it's, it's just too much work to get, the, to get the nugget. And so we're developing, our next experiment is going to be around, we're calling it Bring a Lesbian to Work Day. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's basically a one-day shadow program where we can pair you with someone um, so you can learn. Um, about a different job, a different, like a leadership position. Um, and, you know, part of it, too, is around usually when you have like a mentee and a mentor, the mentor is often more senior and super busy and it, it literally is like a full-time job trying to schedule them, which I totally understand. We, we all get busy, but um, I think one day is more scalable and or that's at least my assumption right now. And my assumption is that everyone, even people who are super busy, I'm hoping even like Ashton Kutcher will be into this, um, you know, he's an investor, right? And so we pair 
you know, a lesbian woman who's interested in investing more with him for one day at South by Southwest. Um, and I feel like that might be able to work, but we're, we, you know, we need to test it and, and sort of see if that solves some of the problems that I think um, that I know exist with mentoring. Right. That's an interesting one, too, because you get to test on both sides, on the mentor mm -hmm. and the mentee side. Yep. Um, all right. So we're, I, I do want to talk a little bit about pivots, which is one of the other hot button terms. But we do have a lot of questions coming in. So let me, um, let me throw a question in here, and then we'll move on and talk about the pivots, too. Um, so one of the things that was asked earlier, actually, was um, in nonprofits, how do you implement lean startup methods through the organization to overcome the planning pitfalls? You know, lean startup, we're talking about lean startup is like fast and you want to move quickly, you want to learn fast. But a lot of times, nonprofits are planned out a couple of years in advance. Yeah. And particularly, yeah, right. So established nonprofits are a little different than startup nonprofits. How do you integrate the ideas? Um, so many things come to mind with this topic. I mean, I, you know, I talk pretty vocally about how I think five-year strategic plans are completely are a complete waste of time, and I think no one should do them. And I think no one. I mean, I've got asked that question more times than I can count. Like, what's your five? You know, where do you see yourself in five years? And I mean, even that, I think, you know, kind of clouds from from running experiments in the now and, so, and sort of planning on those because by the time you get to five years out, I mean, you will have run hopefully hundreds of experiments and you will be at a different place than you could even imagine. And maybe sure you could um, assume right um, that happens, um, but I think that a lot of that time and energy just tends not to be super useful. And I, you know, I know we kind of touched on this a little bit, but I think part of it is because you have different stakeholders, right? In a nonprofit, you have the board, which is, you know, legal, the people, the legal body that is responsible um, financially for the organization in, in most models. You have the staff, the people that are executing it. And then you have the funders, the major donors that have, you know, huge influence because they're the ones writing the checks and they often have very strict stipulations and requirements around how the funding gets spent. Um, and so those three things make it really tough to implement anything um, without a very lengthy plan. Um, and I think what's challenging, especially about the funding models, that they off often come with stipulations that um, require you to go a certain direction. And when you run an experiment that gives you data that you should actually go a completely um, different direction, um, that, that process then becomes hard. And I think that's actually a big, big nugget of what we have to figure out, um, not only with you know, implementing Lean Startup, but just in general. I mean, how... How does it, you know, how can we have more transparency in conversations? And I think, I think big funders are, um, you know, we had a lot of them at the Lean, Lean Impact um, summits that we had. And, um, you know, I think a lot there are, you know, New Media Ventures is, is a funding group that, you know, they're really thinking about Lean Startup and how to um, fund more quickly and, and um, you know, in a more lean, efficient way. Um, but, you know, I think, and I don't know how to solve this problem. I've thought about it for many, many hours. I think, you know, at the end of the day, funders, there's no urgency to change. There's no, you know, they have the money and that you have to apply to get it and there are so many causes that, that um, want and need their funds. Um, and on their side, they get the C3 uh, right off regardless of whether or not it works or not. And obviously they want, you know, um, they want the success stories. Um, but there's no real urgency to change the behavior of how these things um, get implemented, and so that's what we're, you know we're really trying to figure out how can we do this in a way um, that works. And I think I think part of it, um, you know, this is a total buzzword, but um, um, in the for-profit world, there's disruption, right? There's if there's a model that's broken, a new company can come in and sort of turn the old model on its head. Um, we see it all the time with technology, um, and obviously companies can buy the other the other one. Um, but in, in the nonprofit world, it's, it takes longer. You know, is someone going to really um, disrupt United Way overnight? Like, probably not. Um, they're, and not to say United Way, I'm not, I don't want to judge their model, but, you know, they are, they have a very strong infrastructure, they have a very strong process, and so if there's something there that's not working, how would another nonprofit even go about sort of disrupting that model? I mean, I think that's a question I'd, I'd like to ask to the group um, to think about. Right, yeah. I think those are, you know, that's an excellent question. How do you even go about that? But one of the things that's interesting about disruption is sometimes that's a hard question to answer until it's happening on the ground, which is one of the things we're trying to help people do is get more stuff on the ground so you can figure out what's going to work. Um, you did mention Christy George um, or New Media Ventures. Christy George is the 
um, executive director, and we just she spoke last year about new funding models and different ways of working with funders um, for social impact. Um, that was her talk at the Lean Startup Conference, and we just popped that video link into the chat. So if people want to learn more about that, we've got a good resource there. And she'll be interviewing Mitch Kapor this year at the conference in December, and they'll be talking about this specifically. Um, I do think there's an interesting question about, you know, when, when funders say, I want to know that every dollar is going towards something that matters, is going toward the program, but they're willing to spend money on things that are unproven, there's a really big disconnect and potentially an opportunity to work with funders to help them understand how their money can go a lot farther and have a bigger impact if you're testing the ideas as you build. Right. And so I'll be, that's a really great interview, and I'm really glad that's happening. I mean, I think um, one of the things that's interesting about Kapoor and other groups is they, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they're not doing any more C3 funding, right? They're going to all impact investing, right? I believe that's true. Right. So, and I think that's an interesting thing to bring up, and I'm sure Christy will go into this more at Lean Startup, and which is why I recommend that all of you attend, because I think that'll be really helpful is, you know, part of, my concern around that is that obviously there's only so much that can have a revenue model, right? I mean, health and human services, um, and when we talked about two different target groups, like the group of people that you're raising the money from is often different than the people you're serving. Obviously, if you're serving homeless youth, they're probably not going to be also um, your revenue model. That's just that's just not um, the reality of a lot of social good organizations. Um, obviously, there are things that can, and even, you know, I mean, there's stuff, you know, like gay rights is a good example. Um, same-sex marriage, you know, is primarily funded from uh, wealthy gay people who want to get married, and so they are definitely benefiting from having legal marriage, and they're also funding it. Um, but when we try to raise money for homeless youth, for education, those things don't raise nearly the same amount of funds. Um, and I think while I'm a huge proponent of data and experiments and, and even anecdotal data, I think is helpful, but the truth is a lot of, you know, a lot of what exists in the world to solve some of these problems, there's no way to measure the impact that you can have. I mean, I'm even struggling to measure, you know, what has Lesbian to Tech really done in terms of how, we, how we've imp impacted people. And I'm, I'm collecting stories and I'm trying to get all, all the data, but I mean, the truth is now we're like, you know, three steps down the road of how someone, you know, I know someone who literally moved to San Francisco after the summit is, is learning how to code, um, but there's probably a hundred more of those stories that I don't know. Um, and also having an awareness that it's okay not to have all of the data. I mean, I think we have a responsibility to get the data that we can because it's super important, but also to know as funders and the people investing in the work um, that, you know, what happens a lot of times in startups is that people invest in the team. They invest in the leader. Um, they don't necessarily, you know, we don't have the data that says that this is going to be a, you know, billion-dollar startup. And so I think we could do a little bit more of that in the social good world um, and just, you know, sort of trust that there are amazing things that, that can happen if we spent all of our time collecting the data or what happens more than more often than not is that we spend time collecting the wrong data that's actually not really useful because that's the only thing we can collect um, and that actually doesn't do more good. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that you get when you experiment is some, some data as a result of the experiment. So you learned early on that there was an interest in events. That tells you something right away, even if we can't, easily track the outcome of those events, if people hadn't, if, if, if lesbians in tech had not been interested in meeting together, that's a piece of data on its own. It tells you something about the value you're providing to people. So the fact that you are trying things out and not everything works, right there, that is very valuable information. And, you know, we may not always be able to pin down the, the specific outcomes for funders, but being able to say to them, we know that this resonates, and we know these other things don't because we tried them. That's right. that's some powerful information as well. Um, a little bit of a shift in mindset, but um, a lot of this is a shift in mindset, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, one more question um, that comes up a lot around customer development. Somebody asked, and I hear this a lot. So I have an answer for this if you don't. But <laughs> the question is... Um, uh, how do you deal with somebody like Steve Jobs, who seemed to think that customer development lacked value, and the idea that customers don't really know what they want, um, that they don't really know what's best? You know, Henry Ford said, you know, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have had another horse. You know, those ideas. How do you respond to that? 
Yeah, I, I get that a lot too. It's that like gut feeling or it's the, you know, why that like logo or color works better. I just know it will um, or the name is better, you know. And, and I think that's, you know, it's a really interesting question. And I think, you know, for me it's really, it's about testing it. You know, it's, um, I don't always, I actually am pretty skeptical in general of a person. I think it's what gives me character. But um, I, you know, when people tell me that they want something, I'm, I'm a very, I'm operational, I have an operational mind. So I think about all the steps that need to happen to put that idea in the world. And I try to keep people who are really like super positive and think, you know, endlessly about how to, about these new ideas around me because they think it's a good balance. But, you know, I mean, execution is tough. I think people, people are always like, I'm in stealth mode. I have this great idea. And I'm like, right. So like the, the challenge isn't the idea oftentimes. It's how do you, how do you implement it? How do you execute it? Um, I think that's 99% of what makes something successful or not is, is execution. And so, you know, in thinking about that and customer development, it's sort of like, you know, Steve Jobs, obviously a brilliant, brilliant mind. Um, if he would have, you know, made uh, the iPod and put it into the hands of the customers and, and no one wanted it, I bet they would have stopped or, you know, they would have at least pivoted to something something else. And then, you know, I think that's the important part to remember is that, um, sure, like if you have a good, good idea, you have a gut instinct about it, test it, test it and, in a minimum viable product way and um, you know, hopefully a way that doesn't take a lot of resources. Yeah, so one of the things about Apple is that they test things more than you think, right? So they, they do a lot of their testing in secret so we don't see it and there's this big narrative about how everything just sprung from that of Steve Jobs, but um, actually they do a ton of internal testing on all kinds of factors and they do public testing too. Um, I was reminded recently that when the iPhone was first announced, um, I guess Jobs announced it at one of Apple's big shows, but it wasn't available immediately. It was a couple of months out. He showed it, and people could pre-order it, but it wasn't actually in stores anywhere. You couldn't go out and buy it that day. And one of the things that's interesting is a lot of people pre-ordered it, of course, and it's turned out to be a hit. But if a lot of people hadn't pre-ordered it, if it had been completely panned, as many other Apple products have been, it wouldn't be the world-dominating product it is today. They did, in fact, get it in front of people and have a way to see what the feedback was going to be. And they have lots and lots of failed products that sort of show us that not everything that they come up with just flies. Right? There's a, there is a process, and sometimes it's kind of subtle. Um, all right, so I want to um, note one thing that um, uh, we've got somebody from KPOR here saying that they are going to continue. KPOR is funding um, both social impact and more traditional um, kinds of startups. So when we had said earlier we thought they were tailing that off, we were wrong, and I just want to make sure we get that down for the record. Um, they'll continue in both veins. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, pivots, and then we'll uh, – loop in some more questions from our attendees. So pivots is another of the, the big buzzwords. Um, what does it mean? Why do we care? Right. And I, and I think it's, you know, it's like you guys are sensing a theme, right? It's sort of, you know, you create the MVP and then a part of the build measure learn process is what do you do once you have that feedback, right? And hopefully the feedback will either tell you to um, keep going or it'll be, you know, switch directions. And sometimes the direction, you know, like the online summit that we had, it wasn't a really quick, clear switch. I mean, there wasn't a like, okay, this didn't work, so we should try this. It was like, well, we know for sure this doesn't work, so now we're going to try this new thing that may also not work, but at least it's like one step closer. Um, so there's all kinds of pivots. Um, you know, where we are in the process of Lean Impact was we had these, you know, free events. We had the online telesummit, right, and that didn't work. Um, we uh, had in-person free events, and um, that really worked well, but again, no revenue model there, so we had to figure out if this was going to be sustainable or not. And so the next step was like, okay, the, the, the in-person events seem to really work. People really like those. So let's do, um, let's do a half-day summit, try to keep um, expenses low, but um, provide a lot of value since people really liked um, those, those free happy hours. And so we had, you know, fairly successful summits, but, you know, they pretty much broke even. Um, summits really, um, you know, a lot of the revenue generation is around sponsorships. Um, and it was very clear um, from, from doing three different summits um, that the sponsorship was going to be a longer road. And so we really took some time to figure out what our next pivot was going to be um, and how we wanted to test it. And ultimately, we just, you know, a lot of the feedback we got from sponsors, um, you know, was that they were actually craving a different, a funnel to social good from a technology perspective. A lot of the potential sponsors were tech companies, you know, Salesforce, HubSpots of the world. And what they really wanted was a way to reach social good in a much 
um, more direct way through tech. Um, and so, and also, you know, we also we did another test that I should mention. So a lot of what people told us they wanted was an online course. They wanted more, you know, we had part of the summit was um, you know, more like TED style talks, and then we had an in-depth workshop on Saturday that was all day, you know, way more intensive, um, you know, more similar to like a lean startup machine type of deal, but shorter. And um, people really liked those, and so they were like, we want more of those. Um, you know, a book would be great. People kind of, that's what we got when we talked in person. So we did a crowdfunding campaign to see, um, you know, at this point we had built a pretty good list of, of customers. People actually paid for a ticket to come to the summit, and um, the crowd campa crowdfunding campaign um, didn't work out. We didn't raise very much money at all. Um, and I think there's a lot of assumptions we could kind of make on make around that. Some of them were, you know, the social good world. You know, if you're a staff person at a nonprofit and you take a course for um, Lean Impact, what will that really get you? What's the urgency around that? Will it get you a promotion? Will you, will you get paid more? Um, will you know have the tools to succeed? Maybe, um, but the, or the urgency we felt like maybe wasn't as high. And so ultimately, you know, to continue the work, we knew that we were going to have to raise money through a different venue. And so now we're kind of, we're still doing, um, lean, we're going to do Lean for Social Good track at Social Good Tech Week, but really, you know, we're kind of like pivoting to this new avenue of, of raising money through providing value um, through tech companies and tech staff, um, also kind of integrating Lean Startup principles. Um, but it's, a, it's, def, it's a, probably the biggest pivot we've made, um, you know, in hopes to find a more sustainable revenue model. Um, so, one of the people asked, how did you know the Telesummit wasn't working? What was the measurement? And we've also had a lot of people asking about your experience with crowdfunding. So you could talk about those things a little bit. Um, they're not super specific to Lean Startup, but lots of folks want to know. So let's totally. dive in. Yeah, I have lots of thoughts around from both those things. Um, the, the Telesummit, you know, we put a lot of work, you know, on speakers and, and social media, and we just felt like $20 was a pretty low price point, and since we only sold four tickets, we just felt like that wasn't um, successful enough. We certainly could have done free, but, um, you know, we wanted there to be some barrier to entry. Um, and we wanted, you know, when it's online, it's sort of, you know, uh, having an in-person experience. People are a little more present. People show up. I mean, you obviously can do that online to some extent. But we wanted, we thought if we were going to do free, that we actually we wanted the in-person interaction because it's just a higher touch point. Um, obviously, if you have someone's attention for a couple hours in person, that's just higher than a tell someone where they get emails and they can be pinged and all those things. So we sort of felt like, okay, we tried the online for a price. Let's try offline for free and kind of keep going from there. Um, crowdfunding is really interesting, and I see a lot of, especially nonprofits, they want to, they actually, on my consulting side, they come to us and they, they want this big strategic plan on how they're going to execute crowdfunding, which I think is like a little funny because part of the part of the whole thing behind crowdfunding is it's this tool to run an experiment, essentially. And part of it is like you can just put a 60-second video, right? I mean, half half. The people, you know, I mean, depending on what the product is and how, what the price point is, but a lot of people, they might not even watch the video, right? You have different levels of what people can pre-sell, um, and there's this whole mentality around crowdfunding that's really amazing, actually, to see culturally how it's shifted. You know, we're willing as a customer to, to, to invest in something, to be part of the early side of a, a project, of a product, a community, um, even before it gets, you know, built or created. And I think that um, that culture is really powerful. And I think if you can use crowdfunding, you should. Um, anytime you can use crowdfunding, you should. And but be be cautious because while videos are great, and I do think there's a certain time and a place to invest in an amazing video because that can have such a huge impact. Um, it's also really cool just to test an idea with a short video, you know, emotional, heartfelt. And they actually, um, you know, Indiegogo. A lot of their data says that a two-minute video that's just you talking to the camera can often be more powerful than a highly edited sort of produced video. Um, and so I think if you can do that, I mean, it, takes, it could take like an hour to create a crowdfunding campaign and, and give you um, a lot of data. But also, also know that it, it, you need a list of people. This is, you know, if you create a crowdfunding campaign and you have no emails to send it to, I mean, just sending a tweet with a crowdfunding campaign, it's not going to really do much. You really need at least um, a small group of people, even if they're just friends and family, that really get behind it early and kind of giving them a heads up, like, hey, that we're about to send this out. Like, we need your support early. Here's a sample tweet. Here's a sample Facebook post. Here's a sample email you can send to your friends. I mean, those things really make or break um, crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah, I, mean, I think typically crowdfunding campaigns that are successful are um, 
a point along which you're doing a lot of work. You've already done a lot of work right. to build a community. The crowdfunding campaign helps you continue it and, um, <clears throat> and draw some resources from that community and learn from it. But it is not the start. It's when you've been doing a lot of work already and you have some folks that you're already in touch with. Um, but it does, it, it can be a nice tool for some of the Lean Startup methods because it is a chance to experiment. It gives you a way to test, like with the Telesummit, if it, people don't buy, they're not buying, you've learned a lot. That's, oh you know, that's huge. Um, it can also be um, a method for customer development as you, if you offer different things and you can learn what are people interested in buying at different levels and they give you different kinds of feedback about what they want. Um, they can get very interactive. So there's lots of, you can use it as just an experiment in itself, but you can also use it to learn more from your community, um, whether you re your, meet your funding goals or not. Right, totally. It's such a good learning tool. And I will say what was most interesting recently about crowdfunding, so we, we had a San Francisco summit for Lesbian 2 Tech, and then everyone on the East Coast was like, you should do one out here. And, and so we decided, I was like, look, like, this is a lot of work to turn around in three months. I'm going to try to pre-sell tickets, $20,000 in five days. If, you, if we can raise that, then I will commit to, to doing this summit. And we, we met the goal, um, $20,000 in five days, which I was like shocked by. And um, we put together this summit, and what was interesting is that I thought that meant that we were going to be able to get, that was probably around 100 tickets, and I was like, great, so we, if we got 100 tickets in five days, then we should be able to sell 300 more tickets by in three months. And honestly, we didn't sell any tickets until like the last week um, yeah. after the crowdfunding campaign. And, and this is, you know, this is New York in the summer, and this is, you know, a lot of different factors, and obviously I think after like April, which was the crowdfunding campaign, the... The, the weather got better and people checked off of emails. So there, there are other factors to think about, but it's also like, you know, if you, if you are successful or not successful, you have assumptions around that, but those also may not, may or may, may not be true, which is, I think, interesting to think about. Yeah, yeah, that's so, that's so true. I would also say one other thing. Events, you sell most of your tickets at the end. Right. <laughs> that's how that goes. But, you know, the crowdfunding gives you a little bit of insight into how things are developing. So we've just a few more minutes, and I want to bring in a couple of questions um, from our attendees. Going back to pivoting, um, somebody asked an interesting question. How does pivoting interact with your vision and mission statement? Oh, the vision and mission statement. I mean, that's, you know, that's one of those things that um, it should be ever-evolving. I mean, I think it's great to come up with a mission statement. It's you know, but I God, I mean, I, I've seen I've been a part of organizations that have literally spent months and months creating a vision statement and a mission, and I think it shouldn't really take you more than a few days. I mean, if it's taking more than it should be like a tweet. Like if you can if you can do it in the time that it takes you to do a tweet, like that should be where you're at. And I think um, so many people get so attached to those words and like what it means. Obviously, it's good for everyone to have a north star. Um, and to be on the same page, but I think that we get a little too attached um, to it, and I think we should be more flexible with with those things and um, let the let the mission statement um, pivot as as you pivot and and run in more experiments. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting point. Like we think of a vision and mission statement as things that are set in stone, and we're going to orbit around them. But the idea of pivoting is that you've learned new things and you're going to move in a somewhat new direction with your foot planted in what you've learned. You're not completely going off in a whole new direction. You're taking what you've learned and moving forward. So you're t and, and moving forward within your, within your strategy. So right. it might affect your vision and mission statements. You might learn some things that make you think differently about how you want to build for the world. Um, but it's not necessarily that you're abandoning everything that you've created so far because the idea of a pivot is very specifically building on what you've learned right? and, and moving from wh where you've collected data and where you have more certainty than you did before. Um, all right, so as we're hitting the end here, I want to note that Leanne is going to be giving a full-day workshop at the Lean Startup Conference. The conference is the week of December 8th, and her workshop is on December 9th. Um, and Leanne, I want to ask if you have any tools, resources, um, other conferences and events that you want to recommend for folks um, to learn more. Yeah, and so if you go to leanimpact.org, um, we have tons of stories and tons of examples right now of people who have used Lean Startup principles in their social good organizations. We also have the A to Z dictionary, which kind of breaks down the terminology. Um, uh, if you go to social good, 
uh, socialgoodtech.org. That's the um, website for Social Good Tech Week, which is going to have a lot of um, lean startup activities. We'll have a workshop during that day. Um, Udemy is a great resource. We actually, I think we have a store on Lean Impact that connects to a lot of the Lean Startup um, courses. I think those are always super helpful. I mean, obviously, if you haven't read the book, I would recommend doing that. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of, you know, really interesting stories of, of social good organizations um, on there. And we actually have videos from the past summits, which are super really short, like five minutes, and super helpful. Yeah, right. That's so, the videos are so great. Um, and we've been put dropping the Lean Impact um, URL into the chat throughout because it has terrific resources. That is really, a, like Leon has built something tremendous over there. It is really worth um, some time. You will find amazing resources and connections there. All right, well, thank you all so much. This has been a lot of fun and a lot of great ideas have come out of this. We will send the recorded video around to everybody, and you are more than welcome to share it with your organizations. Thank you all so much. Thank you. We'll see you hopefully in December. Take care. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks, Leanne. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. This wraps up our show. So please visit leanstartup.co for more information on the Lean Startup Conference happening December 8 to 12 in San Francisco. Bye, everyone.